Uh, I've done the start. So if any of you has seen already, this presentation has an interactive component. Uh, you can participate by joining this QR code, everyone who didn't already, maybe wants to do it now. Otherwise, we'll just continue. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, whenever there's an interactive part, there's the, the link and you can type it in manually, but just that. So I want to talk about geometry nodes, specifically how it's handled, in, handled internally. It's mostly a very technical talk um, for people who are curious about how geometry nodes works, but also for people who want to build their own node systems, um, either in Blender or independently. I will start with talking about some very basic approaches for how to evaluate node trees, then go over what we do for geometry nodes, which um, goes a lot into lazy evaluation. And in the end, I will talk about array processing, which means we have like lots of like large amounts of data, like particle systems, whatever, with millions of particles. And we have like all these small math functions, like adding positions and doing vector math, and how do we do that efficiently? Um, so the, these are the three main topics. And First, I would like to know from you a little bit, like, what's your background? Because as I said, it's mostly a technical thing, and it, well, it's a bit of an experiment to see how well these graphics work. It would be <laughs> so mostly technical. That's nice. I'm usually most impressed by people who like are in the both section, like they do the most crazy thing, like Simon Thomas. Um, who is helping us with the geometry nodes development a lot. Personally, I'm more on the technical side. I'm the lead developer for geometry nodes nowadays, working together a lot with Hans. Um, I'm working on nodes in Blender for 10 years now already. Started out with animation nodes back in 2014 and then was hired in 2018 by the Blender Institute. And then in 2020, we started working on geometry nodes. Um, just as a side note, like whenever, I, like my favorite thing is when people share their early experiments with new features in geometry nodes. Like it's super motivating, super nice to see. Um, so please do more of that. Super nice. But gets in, let's get into it. So the just as a very basic start setup with like a very simple node tree. I assume that people know what it does. Like you get there. Or, mesh in, do a simple subdivision surface, and extrude all the, the faces out. Um, I just want to use it as a basic example for the next few slides. So the most simple approach, or the, the simplest approach to do, like to evaluate a node, is to first do a so-called topo sort, a topological sort. Um, that means you order the nodes in, in a way where on the, like every node um, comes before the nodes that need it. So for example, the add node comes after the value node. That basically in this ordering it means you can evaluate them one by one from left to right without getting into weird dependency issues. That also only works if you have uh, no cycles in your, like no link cycles in your node tree, but none of the other methods I will talk about um, can work with those either, so that's fine. This is actually the approach that animation nodes used to use, like it's a bit more complex than that, but it essentially just sorted all the nodes and then generated a Python script that sorted them, um, like that wrote a little script for every single node and then executed that. But it does have some big downsides. Mainly, you are evaluating all the nodes that you don't even need um, because there's no checking here which nodes you need. And also very hard to parallelize. Um, so if you have this linear order of nodes, like deciding which nodes can be run in parallel and which can't, like it's very hard. Um, but it's still like this turbo sort is still very like very basic graph algorithm that you need a lot when working with node systems. Um, so are there multiple possible orderings? Let's see what you think. So yes is correct. Like for example, the, the value node could be at the very beginning and will still be a correct ordering. Um, nice, that worked. 
<laughs> um, so the next step up is to do uh, step up is to do what I would call a two pass evaluation. That means you first filter down the set of nodes that you want to evaluate and then evaluate those. Um, that's in this example, that's fairly easy because, for example, the add node that I added in the end, like its output is not used at all. We can just check, okay, which nodes are not used by any um, by any output and just remove them. But there are also more complex ways um, that this can handle, and while it's like a fairly simple approach, it's actually what many node systems in Blender use. For example, cycles, when you have a mix node and you set the, the mix factor to zero or one, it just does a pre-pass over everything and determines which inputs to the to the mix nodes are actually used and which are not and just like uh, removes basically everything that's not needed. Or in the dependency graph evaluation, it's like not a node system, but like more an internal node system. Um, we also have animated visibility and there's like a pre-pass to figure out which um, objects need to be evaluated and then there's a second pass to determine, like to actually evaluate them. Um, but that still has issues with nodes like the switch node. Like we don't use that in, in geometry nodes because you just can't determine the set of nodes that you want to evaluate before you actually start evaluating large parts of the, of the node tree. That's because like you, you can't determine the, the nodes be first. The switch nodes um, can also depend on each other. Like you would need multiple passes first to find out which um, nodes are needed for the first set of switch nodes maybe and then the nodes that are like depend on the next set of switch nodes. And it's very tricky and, and difficult to write this in multiple passes. Um, so we don't do that. Um, also a reason why we don't want to use that very implicit approach in um, geometry nodes is that it's important for users to be able to really be sure that certain nodes are not evaluated because if you have build like large assets and, and like node group assets, um, you often have to disable large like parts of a node tree depending on some inputs and you really want to be sure that those are not evaluated accidentally because that just breaks the entire asset workflow. So the solution that we use for that is like something that I call request-based evaluation. So instead of figuring out which nodes you need first, you just start at the final output, like the thing you want to compute, and then work yourself, work your way backwards, uh, backwards by requesting everything that's used by the output. And then in this case, the switch node is evaluated and checks, okay, I need the condition input first. So it requests the condition input. And at some point it gets the um, reside back and then let's say the, the condition value is true, then we know that the false input is unused and it's actually quite important that we talk about that next. That you also have to send back the information that the false input is unused um, and that the true input is used and then when that value comes back again to the switch node, you just forward it to the output in this case. Um, and that basically allows you to do everything in, in one pass. You just start at the output, request inputs as you need them. Um, but it, it's quite different from all the other node systems that we have in Blender already, which all do this two-pass evaluation. Um, so how might this look like in code? We have in, in geometry nodes, we have this concept of or this lazy function class, um, which is all like built around the idea of this lazy evaluation where you request inputs lazily, wait for them to arrive, and then re-entry the function again to um, continue the con um, evaluation. In this case, just to go over this code example quickly, this like simple version of a switch node. Like first, you try to get the condition input and it, and it might not be available yet, in which case you just return from the current function and then the function is called again once the value is available. Then you check is the value true and then in case it is true, then you say, okay, a certain input is not used. Um, and the other value you request again, and then the value is probably not yet available. So you have to wait again until it comes back. And then when it comes back, you can actually set the value as an output. And that's obviously a bit different than the actual implementation is like slide where code, which is a bit simplified, but the overall idea is very much the same. And actually all nodes and geometry nodes are implemented in, like they are lazy functions in the end, 
although for the majority of nodes that laziness aspect is completely hidden away in the API, like we have a higher level API and that's used to implement geometry nodes. Um, and those, yeah, they, they don't have any laziness built in, but then there are certain specific nodes like the switch node, like the different kinds of switch nodes or repeat zones and all of these um, which have specific, which need sp uh, specific laziness behavior. So those are directly implemented as lazy function. Um, another nice aspect of this internal API is that it's actually completely separate from geometry nodes. So we can have a unit tests, which like build a couple of lazy functions, combine them, evaluate them, and to, to check that everything works. Then the next level up is when we have a lazy function for every geometry node, we can combine them into a graph. This graph is very similar to the geometry nodes graph that you build yourself. Uh, it does have some small differences, like we have to do some special behavior for dealing with uh, anonymous attributes, of which, um, which have like automatic lifetimes, and we have to somehow figure out dynamically how long these attributes live, which is somewhat tricky to do that deterministically specifically. Um, and also zones um, are represented a bit differently here. Um, and then when we have built this graph, then we have the core part of geometry nodes, which is like the core part of the geometry nodes evaluator is actually just evaluating this lazy function graph, um, which is not that easy because you have to pass all these messages around and then it becomes more tricky once you actually start doing multi-threading and all kinds of optimizations that I will talk about next. This graph at the bottom is actually like a debug view that I use for development. Um, I have a core debug tool, it's add-on on the extensions platform that you can use to export, like to visualize this graph for every node tree you have. It's not really something users need, but when it might be interesting to people to see what is actually generated under the hood. Then there's one big limitation for um, laziness and that it's within geometry nodes you have laziness, but for all the inputs that geometry nodes uses, we don't have that yet. It's mostly a limitation of, um, for historic reasons, like the modifier stack evaluation, that like we have to evaluate every modifier from the top to bottom, even if the last modifier doesn't even use its input. There's just no way to do that currently. Um, that's something to work on in the future. Now to get from, to the first actual optimization thing, which is when you have multiple of these messages, like we have the request message, the response message, and the message that some input is unused. We somehow have to decide in what order do we want to process them. And it turns out that the order matters a lot. For example, in this case, we, um, like only one of the two set position nodes is used, but in the um, handle the request measures, uh, message first and ignore the unused measures, uh, message for a moment. The cube node will generate some mesh, which might be heavy, might not be heavy, don't know. And then it's sent to both of the set position nodes. And now when one of the set position nodes is evaluated, it wants to modify the mesh. But since you have two references to it, it's like immutable you, because you can't change it in, in both places. Um, so one of the set position nodes has to make a copy of the data. Um, but that's only necessary because there are two references to it. But if we propagate the message that a certain value is unused first, we know that only one of the set position nodes is used and it is the only, like the input socket of it is the only owner of that geometry data. So it can just modify it without caring about other um, references. It used to be more of a problem than it is nowadays, mainly because we have implicit sharing now, which means when we copy a mesh internally, it rarely copies any large data because all the attributes are shared um, again and are only actually copied when they are modified. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's still, I have seen files when I implemented this optimization that were just so bad because there were so many un unnecessary copies of data just because we didn't know early enough that some intermediate value is not needed anymore. Then the next big topic is when you have multiple nodes scheduled, like in this case, we have the 
uh, joint geometry nodes, which ask for the two bounding box nodes, which then ask for the primitive node outputs. Some have to decide in which order do we want to evaluate these nodes. Like after the first bounding box nodes run, you can either run the next other bounding box nodes or the primitive node that it requested. And one of those strategies works better than the other. Um, want to give a little uh, um, analogy. Imagine like breath first search, uh, breath first um, evaluation is when you start doing many side projects um, and you start adding more side projects and that takes up all your, your mental capacity. And at some point you might go back to your earliest project, but in the end you are slower versus when you do like death first, which means like you, um, if you need something for your current project, you just do it now instead of doing another project in between. And so in the end, I just check your responses. Uh, the death first is correct um, because it leads to very smaller peak memory usage because you have much less intermediate um, values that are not actually needed where versus with death first and um, you basically only compute what you actually need next. There's some value in using um, breath, evalu breath first um, evaluation at the beginning just to get all the threads active um, because then you can do more stuff in parallel. Like if you are two people, you might be able to do two projects at the same time, but then not fan out more than that. But in practice, that didn't really like, usually uh, all the threads become active fast enough that it's not really worth making a distinction here. Then one of the key aspects of the lazy function API that we use internally is that you can combine multiple functions into this graph and that the graph itself becomes a lazy function again, which means that you, and then the, this lazy function has all the same laziness characteristics that you would have and you, if you wouldn't, I love if we would inline the entire graph into another graph. Um, this is super useful um, because it allows us to build many smaller graphs instead of one huge one without losing any of the laziness aspects. And we use that a lot for node groups and zones. So node groups, there are two main ways to handle them. And again, geometry nodes is doing it differently from all the other node systems in Blender because the first way to do it, which like all the other node systems do, is to flatten the entire node tree um, into a single graph that doesn't have any groups anymore. That's, that can be done as a pre-process and it makes some things easier. Like you can, um, the evaluation becomes easier and some optimizations also become easier. Especially if you do this two pass evaluation, you can more easily like iterate over the entire graph on one level without having to worry about nesting later on. Um, then for geometry nodes, we do not flatten the graph and that's for multiple reasons. One is the evaluator needs to handle nesting anyway, especially now that we have zones, because you can't flatten a, a repeat zone or a for each zone in the same way that you can flatten node groups. And also geometry node groups or node systems tend to become way bigger than shader node trees or compositor node trees, which is probably also a part of why, like, um, which this is enabled a lot by this laziness and using switch nodes. But if you have like node systems that are, if they would all be in line, like 10,000 nodes, which I've seen many times already, um, would be quite a waste of time to inline all of that, especially if most of these nodes are not actually evaluated in the end, which is also quite common. I said there are some optimizations that you can do to improve node groups, uh, to like improve performance that are easier to implement on a flat, on a flattened node tree. But so far we haven't needed them. And if we need them, we could still like selectively flatten some node groups. That's not an issue at all. And for zones, actually quite interesting because the evaluation of zones just like for the repeat zone, um, in the top level graph of these geometry nodes, node tree, each zone is collapsed into a single node, which then contains a dynamically generated graph. 
Um, for example, we see a repeat zone with three iterations and that when the repeat zone is first evaluated, it generates the smaller graph based on the number of iterations that you actually passed in while evaluating the node tree. And that is just like, inserted into the, um, into the lazy function graph. And this is super nice because we don't actually have to change the um, core evaluation code, which is fairly complex. Um, but to add these types of zones, we only have to change the code that takes a geometry node tree and turns it into a lazy function graph and all the evaluation stuff stays the same, which also gets us many optimizations for free. So for example, if the repeat zone contains parts that can be parallelized because they are not all um, dependent on the previous iteration, they actually run in parallel. Like you can have, if you have 20 threads, you can run like have um, each thread currently working on a separate iteration of the repeat zone, um, which is very tricky to do in, in other ways. Um, right. Next big topic, multi-threading. Um, it's actually not too hard to do with this general architecture <laughs> of sending messages around. Like this is, makes it easier um, to get multi-threading correct than if you um, work with shared memory and stuff. Um, and I also want to differentiate between two kinds of multi-threading here. One is you want to run nodes in general, uh, in parallel, versus running um, specific geometry algorithms in parallel within a node. So obviously we always want to run, like use many threads when evaluating a single node. Like when you build a big cylinder mesh, you might want to use multiple threads to initialize the positions. Um, but what we are talking about here is just running nodes like um, complete nodes in parallel. Um, so how many threads should be used here? Let's see. Yeah, it, it depends, <laughs> surprisingly. <laughs> um, so in the case where the cube node and the cylinder node actually are very like produce small geometries, you don't want that you want to use a single thread when they generate larger geometries, you want to run them in parallel. Um, and then inside of these nodes, if you generate larger geometries, you might want to use even more threads, of course. Internally, we use um, TBB, a library from Intel, um, for uh, multi-threading. I just want to briefly mention how that, like the, the basic idea. TBB uses a strategy for distributing work that's called task dealing. And I also want to give a small analogy for that. Imagine we have like one, uh, we have 20 office workers sitting on the tables where, where each office worker like corresponds to a thread and they each have a stack of paper with tasks on, them, on their desk. And everyone is just working on their own tasks. But when someone is done with their tasks, they just start walking around stealing tasks, like half of the tasks from other persons, going back to their plate and continuing working which is very different from the idea of having some manager which assigns the task to people. Like these are the big two different approaches. And we use this task stealing approach, which has the big benefit that it scales much better when you have many threads. It might sound a bit weird at first, but you actually start out with having only one thread and then it has like potentially big chunk of tasks and then all the other th threads randomly walk around checking if any threads have task available. But as soon as one thread start, like steals half of the task and there are two threads having tasks and then it's very quickly distributed through all the course without a lot of overhead. So that scales very well. But there's a problem um, with what I described so far. Like the multi-threading in general is fairly straightforward. So they send the messages. We still have to reflect some kind of mutex on, on the nodes whenever we, we send a message to a node. And that can be expensive when you have like tons of small nodes which don't take a long time to evaluate to have lock a mutex and have this in the thread communication all the time. And usually you would solve that like if you have 10 million particles and you want to split up the evaluation over, over them, you would just use a grain size. So instead of having each task be a single particle, you say, okay, I want to process 1000 particles at a time. And that's 
easy to do in some cases, like on the left, ca uh, on the left side, um, where all the tasks are the same size, we can easily split them up. And even if they have different sizes, but we know the size beforehand, you can still fairly easily split them up into like equally ch uh, sized chunks. But then with geometry nodes, it's very tricky because we don't know beforehand how long a node will take to evaluate. And even the same node can sometimes be very slow and sometimes be very fast, so it's hard to um, decide um, how many nodes should be packed together into one, um, into one task. And the ideal solution is obviously only to use threading when it's actually beneficial, but how do we detect that it is beneficial? And for that, we use a strategy that I call lazy threading, which mainly means that we start out assuming that everything is small and only use a single thread. We don't even lock any mutexes in, in this case. Um, and then each task itself, while it runs, it can send information to the scheduler that started it, saying, okay, it started already and it probably take a while to evaluate. You might want to take the tasks that are currently scheduled on this thread and move them somewhere else. Um, and that works internally by using some thread local storage. And the tricky thing is when, how do we decide when to send this notification from the task, like why a node is evaluating, how, how does it decide when to send this information to the scheduler? Because we also don't want to add new code in all kinds of places. And the nice observation is that we actually have this information everywhere already. We have so many cases where we do so-called parallel for loops um, where we iterate over large amounts of data in parallel, and all of those cases already have a grain size. Like the, uh, in all of those cases, we already decide, okay, at which point is it worth using multiple threads? And by just adding this check in the parallel for, or this sending this notification in the parallel for case, in the case when the grain size is smaller than the actual amount of data you have, um, allows us to get all the benefits of this approach without actually adding any extra code in all the nodes, which works super well. And actually, since we implemented this, um, we have no problems with overhead from threading because it really only happens when, you, when it's actually worth it, which is quite, quite neat. So the next topic, which is array processing. Um, the basic problem statement is quite simple. You have a bunch of inputs for each, like you have an input for each index basically, and you want to compute an output value for every index. And the goal is to have high performance and uh, low peak memory usage. Um, so in this case, the, the question is like, how many fields are valid here? Because in geometry nodes, we currently mainly do um, Array processing in the form of field evaluations. I don't talk too much about the details of how fields work in this talk, but only about the actually core processing part. Um, but thought it might still be fun to check it. I wonder what the third one is. So two would be the correct answer here because we have the selection input and the value input on the store named attribute, which are both fields, which are both evaluated in that node. Um, maybe someone can tell me later what the third field is. <laughs> yeah. But before talking about that, I actually want to mention two things that we do not do yet, um, which we might want to do in the future. One is we don't do any GPU processing in geometry nodes at all yet. And there are a couple of reasons. One of the big problems or like difficulties with having with using the GPU is that geometry nodes evaluation is fairly deeply integrated into the scene evaluation, um, which is different from the other parts where we use the GPU already, which is like the rendering or doing GPU um, subdiv or running the compositor, which all run after the scene evaluation and basically have the whole scene ready and the output of those systems are usually not used on the CPU anymore. Whereas in geometry nodes, it's very often the case that the output of geometry nodes is used in places that only run on the CPU again. So you have a fair amount of complexity deciding, okay, when is it worth using the GPU? Um, and then there's the problem of 
uh, shader compilation. I guess many people know that from Eevee, that shaders can be very slow to compile. And to me, that's really like one of the big things. I don't want geometry nodes evaluation to take long to start to run. It should basically like always feel instant. I haven't seen any file yet where it isn't instant that the evaluation starts and there's no compile time overhead. I think that's important. Also, we need a, a CPU implementation anyway because some people don't have a compatible um, GPU or on a render farm. So, and obviously, we often don't need the GPU for many computations. Lastly, the bottlenecks are usually elsewhere, like the error processing part for pretty much all the scenes that I have seen is very rarely the bottleneck in a scene. Instead, we have things like BVH tree lookups, raycasts, finding the nearest point, which are slow, doing subdivision surfaces on the CPU, doing mesh boolean. <laughs> it's like, and when opening any production files, those are the things that are slow. And actually, like just adding two arrays together is like super fast compared to that. Um, so while GPU processing is very well suited to processing array, like the, the kind of arrays that we have, it's uh, not really a priority right now. Also, what we don't do is any just-in-time compilation um, on, for the CPU. Um, it has similar problems compared to uh, the GPU stuff. It's a bit similar to do actually nowadays with LLVM. You can, it's very straightforward to just generate some LLVM intermediate representation which is a library that which then can compile it to optimize machine code. But you also have the same problem as with compiling for GPU, that compiling any, any small program just takes time and more time than I would want to wait for it. And especially in geometry nodes, like for shaders, you have one big node graph which is compiled. In geometry nodes, you have like small shaders basically everywhere, like every field evaluation needs some GPU compilation. Um, uh, yeah, it needs some compilation, I mean. Um, so yeah, it also wasn't really worth it yet. Also, although I did some experiments to check how, what kind of speed up we could expect by just building a node tree out of math nodes and then doing the same thing in C++. And usually I didn't get a speed up that's more than 2x, although I might have missed something here, but um, it's not the kind of speed up that's, like 10 times faster or something. So um, we are fairly close to very good, like optimal performance already. And also um, doing just-in-time compilation is only worth it when you're only dealing with very simple math functions, like adding, subtracting, multiplication. As soon as you start adding something like a square root or logarithm or anything like that, all the benefit is like, it's not worth it anymore. And just the performance is spent doing the actual computation and there's the overhead of not doing um, machine code generation is um, measurable. So when starting to build this system, one important question is, should we optimize the evaluation for latency or for throughput? And I want to give a simple analogy again for what it means. Um, imagine you build bike path between two villages and um, you build one that is like a single lane and it's like super high quality you can ride very fast in it and you can get from village a to village b very quickly and that would mean that you have a low latency you can get there very fast but on the flip side you can't have many people using that path at the same time because you can't just drive next to each other and so the throughput would be somewhat low. And that is compared to building a path that's much wider, um, but is low quality. You can only write very slowly on it. And, but so the, the latency would be low getting from village A to village B is uh, slow, but you can get way more people over that path. Um, so the throughput would be high. And let's see what people think, what we should optimize for. The correct answer is throughput. Um, it's actually a nice uh, general rule of thumb when you optimize for something that you, or when you write code that usually runs on a lot of data, 
that you want to write or optimize or write your code for the case when you have a lot of data. And then when you actually only happen to have like, let me give an example, um, you um, have like a party system again with a thousand points and you write your code processing all these points in one go instead of writing your code that processes one particle at a time. Because usually as developer, we would think, okay, I write my code to handle one case and then to handle the case, uh, to handle many elements, I just call the code that handles one element many times. But usually it's way more efficient to write the code to handle ma many elements. And then in the case where you only have one element, still use that code that has processes many elements. Um, even though it, like initially as a developer, you want to reduce the, um, like you want to reduce the problem down to one element, but usually you lose a lot of optimization opportunities that way. There are many, uh, cases where you want to optimize for latency though. For example, when you evaluate a large armature with lots of little dependencies everywhere where many things depend on each other in a row uh, on a chain, then it's important that each and every single evaluation is very fast because you can't run them in parallel anyway. So with that in mind, yeah, similar to the lazy function um, API, we also have a so-called multifunction API, which is designed to process large amounts of data together. And it also has like this, these API functions to get inputs and um, set outputs. In this case, we get, um, so that's a function that adds two integers or two arrays of integers. And we get the inputs and these are two, um, what we call V arrays or virtual arrays. Those are often just normal plain arrays, but in many cases they're also just single values. Like when you have a math node and you plug in one input that's an attribute and then the other one is a single value, then you somehow have to handle that case. You don't want to um, create an array for every input because it's just lots of extra memory and it's not really worth it. And then for the output, we just get a span, mutable span, which also means it's just a plain C or C++ array. And then this um, just iterates over all the elements you're currently supposed to process and adds them together and writes the result back. There um, is one important detail about this line, which is that the caller of the function is responsible for providing the memory where the result should be written into. Um, this allows for much better memory reuse between calls because then the, the caller, which knows about all the functions that have to be evaluated, can like reuse the memory versus when the function itself would have to allocate it, you, you, it would be much harder to reuse existing uh, allocated memory. This part is currently still fairly slow in the state because it's using these virtual arrays, which means that to access an element in it, you actually have to go through a virtual function call, um, which can be detrimental for performance. And we'll talk about ways to improve that in a moment. Also, this whole approach of implementing multi-functions uh, has a fair amount of boilerplate. So internally, we, we often use some build utilities, which basically take a lambda and just generate this entire multi-function for it, which basically does the same thing that I showed before, but it also made automatically optimizes for cases where an, uh, one end of the inputs is an array and the other is a single value or the other way around or both are single values or both are arrays. Um, but with that, you also get a big problem, which is that you have a combinatorial explosion of possible inputs. So for example, if you have a node which uh, has three inputs, then um, and each of these inputs might be a single value or an array, then you get eight different cases. And eight different cases may still be fine, but we actually have more case and more things to consider. Like they might not be an array or a single value, they might be the index field, which is yet another kind of virtual array, um, or something else. And so you get this this trade-off between the, the binary size, because generating all these cases 
um, increase the binary size and have some example of that on the next slide. And also increasing the compile time versus the performance you can expect. Obviously, you can expect best performance by just generating optimized code for all the different cases, but that comes at a, at a cost. So we um, deal with that situation in two ways. One is we provide easy high-level control for uh, specifying which optimization cases should be generated. So for example, I, now I added this one line. We specified, okay, I want to optimize for the case that the first input is like either an array or a single value, but all the other ones should be handled more generically. Um, and we have different ways to, to specify those. And we can see that on the in the table, we have four main methods to do so-called de-virtualization, which means that's just optimizing for different cases that don't require the virtual function call. The, okay, the simple cases, we actually do the virtual function call, and we can see it doing that with the add node. Um, it's like super slow compared to what will come next, like taking more than a second in my example setup. The material no, uh, materialized mode is actually the second approach to how we handle this um, combinatorial explosion. It's like an implementation um, that iterates over all the elements, over all the virtual arrays, that is more optimized. Um, so it processes smaller chunks of data, so it doesn't have to do a virtual function call for every single element, but it's the, the, the code size scales linearly with the number of inputs instead of exponentially. And with that, you can see, okay, compared to the um, simple approach um, that makes like the map range node, if that's used for all the different combinations for the map range node, that's like 30 kilobytes. But it, um, um, for example, when using it on the add node, it makes it way faster already for fairly little extra overhead. And same thing for the logarithm um, function. Then we have this mode that I shown above where we want to specify some, like that some input is likely to be an array and the other ones are likely to be single values and just optimize for that case, which is very typical, for example, for the map range node, where in the most common cases, you, like the value input is an array and everything else is a single value. So we generate optimized code for that case. And all the other, other cases use like fallback implementation that's still fairly good, but a bit slower. And we can see that generating these multiple cases already um, adds another 100 kilobytes. And then the last method is all spanner sync, which means we basically optimize for all the different cases. And for the map range node, that means generating a lot because we actually have like the map range has different interpolation modes and the clamping options. So all of these <coughs> add to the number of cases that need to be generated. So it adds a megabyte of extra data, just code that's generated by the compiler just for the map range node. That's a bit too much. Um, it's just not worth it. But then for the add node, on the other hand, um, which also doesn't have the same jump here, it's really worth it because it's used a lot and you get a nice benefit. But then for the logarithm no, um, node again, like you can see that the jump between the materialized and the all span or single mode is actually very um, smaller. So, and then it's like case by case basis, you have to decide which version you choose. And the idea of having this high level control with a single line, which then uses some template magic um, under the hood to generate all these cases is that you can easily test it out, see if it's worth it, and then decide on a case by case basis. Then for multi-threading, it's very simpler compared to the lazy function multi-threading because it's an embarrassing, embarrassingly parallel problem. So you can basically split up your the data anywhere you want because all the individual um, evaluations don't depend on each other. And there are three main approaches. One is, okay, you can like, use process each element at once, which is like, kind of bad. Um, then you can use the, what I call here, the all approach. You can take all your data process the first math node, for example, the first add node on it, then you have a large intermediate array, then you process the next add node on all of the data, and so on. That's also fairly inefficient, 
um, and you need a lot of uh, peak, like you have a high peak memory usage because you have these intermediate arrays which are as large as the entire input or as the entire index range that you're processing. And then the better way, of course, is to use chunks. So when you process a million particles again, you uh, one thread starts processing the first thousand particles maybe, and it just uh, does thousand particles with the first math node and then the same particles with the second math node and so on. And that way you can also control the peak memory usage because the intermediate arrays are much smaller. The main question now is which grain size should be used. Like, um, again, if you have a million particles, like should the grain size be on the order of 500 or 1,000 or 10,000 or whatever? And I ran some experiments to figure out some good numbers. Um, that shows on the x-axis the, the grain size that I use and then on the y-axis how long it took and as is usually, as one would usually expect, like when the grain size is too low, you get too much overhead from just iterating over the nodes, so that's way slower. But then starting like 10,000 um, becomes fairly flat. And so it may seem like okay, any grain size is good, although the question is can the, the grain size be also too large? And yes, of course it can be, but the, okay, the most common reason for why it's too large is that you just don't have enough data to distribute it over your threads. But actually there's an even worse case, which is shown when I show the full graph, um, which is that when the, the um, grain size becomes too large, all your intermediate arrays become so large that they don't fit into CPU caches anymore. And it's like really, really bad how, how slow things get when you just, uh, like I was really surprised when generating this data last week but how large these jumps and how suddenly they came there. Um, and that's mainly, like usually we use CPU caches because they have better latency um, than accessing main memory, but in this case we mostly care about the bandwidth and CPU caches also tend to have way higher bandwidth, like on the order of terabyte per second instead of for example, 50 gigabytes per second for main memory. And for these kinds of tasks where we iterate over lots of data, apply a math node, we mainly are mainly bottlenecked by bandwidth. Um, the, um, right now the, the question is how, well, first one of the things that was recently done in Blender um, was to implement the CPU or a new CPU compositor um, as a replacement for the old one. And when Omar implemented that, he also used this multifunction approach with the chunking and then some initial experiments with, again, lots of simple math nodes was actually like 40 times faster than the old CPU implementation, with, which was already optimized compared to the previous implementation. And that was mainly this effect because they evaluated the, the entire image on each math node and then the next math now the entire image again, and you just couldn't benefit from CPU caches at all. Um, now I get to the last topic, which is Simli. Sure, many know Simli, but the general idea is to use special CPU instructions which can process multiple elements at once. Um, for example, four or eight, um, do four or eight additions in one instructions instead of doing everything individually. And we do use that internally. Like we actually, for geometry nodes, we mainly depend on auto vectorization by compilers. But we, we like, or I fine tuned the, the code and made sure by looking at the assembly that the compiler actually understands it and generates the right code, which is easier for some compilers than for others. Um, and we also have a benchmark file that actually becomes like three times slower if we accidentally break auto vectorization for that case. Um, which can also easily happen. But as you can see in the case with SSE2, which means we can do like four additions at the same time, comes 2.7 times faster compared to the baseline implementation, which, which to me is actually pretty good because it shows that we are very close to pretty optimal performance already. And you use, like the, the best improvement you could in theory get is 4x, but this is also measuring the entire field evaluation, but, um, which has a lot more overhead. So we are really spending most of the time in the actual 
edition part of it. Um, and it's great that it can be get uh, can get so much faster. I also tested with AVX2, which we currently don't use in official Blender builds, but I just made my own build to see if it improves things. And it does, but not but too much anymore. Um, so yeah, that's probably a case where we really need um, uh, just-in-time compilation with LLVM to benefit from that. Um, but that's not done yet. Um, last thing, with Simly you always um, have this situation where you have this, the compiler generates the main loop that processes elements and chunks, and then you have a fallback loop um, that um, iterates over all the elements that didn't fit into the chunks. And this is not a graph that I generate with Blender, but with a more um, the simpler um, experiment. And I just wanted to show that aligning your chunk sizes to um, the width or the SIMD width times a loop unrolling factor um, can be quite important. Like we see here every time, for example, um, if we look at the very left, we have like uh, 32 elements which are processed in one loop iteration um, in, the, in the main loop. And as we add more elements, like up to 63, it becomes slower and slower and slower because we have to do all these additional iterations in the fallback loop. And then as we get to 65, uh, 64 um, elements again, it's way faster again. The throughput becomes way higher just because we can process everything in just two iterations instead of 30 something. Um, and the TBB parallel 4 implementation doesn't align things automatically, but we have a small build and wrapper um, that just aligns things on, like, I think it's 64 or something, just to make sure that um, it works well. So I have some final thoughts. One is, and I just want to share when implementing any of these evaluation systems, one is optimize for optimizability. Um, you usually can't optimize everything from the very beginning and optimizing for optimizability to me means that when you look at the profile of your scene or something, like if you use a profiler, it should be very obvious where the bottleneck is and it should ideally be just like a few lines of code. Like you want your hot loops to be very small um, because then, then you can go and really fine tune it and easily test if it has an impact. Um, then when building any kind of node evaluation system, don't be lazy with laziness because adding like support for proper laziness later on to any node system is pretty tricky to do like because it fundamentally changes how you have to evaluate things. Um, so if you find in, uh, yourself in the situation to implement node system evaluation, think about that first. Um, and lastly, when building these kind of array processing um, stuff, then I usually find it very helpful to like get a rough estimate for how things can be in theory. Like just that might usually like to get a good sense of that you have to do experiments yourself, just writing simple C, C++ programs to see how fast can it be, like in, in the simplest cases. And then you can check, okay, how fast is it actually? How close am I? And then you can also figure out, okay, can like, what is my bottleneck? How is it like memory bandwidth, is it latency, is it some, something else? Um, I usually find that much more helpful than trying to compare myself to a previous um, implementation. And because often when really spending time to optimize something, especially in Blender, it's fairly easy to get like 2x or even 5x improvement um, without really going into optimizing it, just making things less bad. <laughs> Um, so, um, yeah, I, I find it very useful to just get a generous sense of how thing fast can things be. Usually you're still, you're still off by like an order, uh, order of magnitude or even more, but just gives you a target basically. That's it. <laughs>